Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. I would like to welcome all of you to the first installment of the Africana Studies Lecture Series for the fall 2010 semester. And this is also the first for this year of the Libraries Community Author Series. And we're really delighted because um, we are kicking the year off on this rainy, windy day, and I really want to appreciate you all for coming, um, with one of our own, Dr. Uh, Walter David, who a lot of you, maybe not you guys, but when he was here, people knew him as Dave Grayson, um, who is Associate Professor of History at Ursinus College, and I apologize to him because the information I had was not accurate because he just got tenure and promotion, and so we want to congratulate him for that. He's coming to talk to us today about his newest book called um, The Path to Freedom, Black Families in New Jersey, which was just published in 2010 by History Press. He is in the process of negotiating his next book, and so he is just moving and shaking, and we are really proud of him. Um, he is now at Ursinus, as I said, but he's also taught at Temple University, Rowan, and at Drexel. And his specialty is 20th century American history with also other specialties in African American and African history. So we're just delighted to have you, glad that you were able to come. Um, I wanted to let you all know that we've got a couple of other um, events scheduled for this semester. Um, on the 27th of October in um, SEER, I think it's 001, we're going to be screening a wonderful film um, called To Me, The Life and Death of Boatulum, Boatulo McCallum. And um, it's going to be sort of co-panel discussed. We're going to screen the film and then have a discussion with the filmmaker, Ian Phillips, and another very distinguished guest, a professor from NYU. Um, who is the mother of the subject of the, the um, documentary. So that's going to be on October 27th. That's the next event, and that will be at 7 o'clock p.m. in SEER 001. I think I have the, the date right, the, the, the room right. There are um, the new Africana Studies posters are out, so please be on the lookout for them. And if you are not on our mailing list or our email list, Please let me know, and I will add you to that list. So without further ado, I want to welcome Dr. Grayson. Thank you so much, Dr. Lucky, and everyone for coming out, as she said, through the difficult weather. It's a pleasure to return to my alma mater and share some time with all of you this afternoon. Um, it's been at least a decade, probably closer to 50 years since I was in this room doing a research project for my mentor in uh, history and peace and justice studies, a number of the co-sponsors and the Africana Studies program at its beginnings, um, could not have gotten to this place with such, a extra such an extraordinary work I've been privileged to work on um, without the foundation that Villanova University and its extraordinary learning community has provided for me. Um, today, I'm taking a theme that crosses um, a number of the chapters in, in my book and in my research, um, focusing on the black middle class in the rural north from 1920 to 1970. Um, I came to this really accidentally. Um, I was working on a different project. I had gotten adopted for my doctoral dissertation to compare racial violence in the United States and South Africa from 1960 to 1973. And so I had gotten that accepted. I had found funding to travel to South Africa and gather my documents. And as I was going through my preparations to begin, uh, both of my parents were in a terrible car accident, but they were lucky to survive. And because they needed my help to come home and help them recover, uh, neither of them could walk and both of them needed help kind of um, getting dressed and, and caring for themselves. Um, I needed to get to a project that would let me continue my studies, but I would be able to be with them at the same time. I wouldn't suspend the progress towards my degree. And so reality <laughs> it's a, it asserted itself on, on the ideals and dreams of my life. 
And so I looked around. I, I grew up in a uh, small farm area of New Jersey. Um, anybody who knows kind of the stereotypes of New Jersey, people tend to so to associate it with Newark or maybe Atlantic City. There are these kinds of visions of New Jersey as um, heavily industrialized, stinking, smelly, not the best images. But um, I grew up in a very different part, the part that earned the name of the Garden State. And just in the time from when I be left home to come to Villanova, and the time that I went back to care for my parents, the area that I had grown up in had changed dramatically. Um, over that less than 10 years, the farming areas had been converted entirely into suburban communities, residential communities, strip malls, uh, large mega mall complexes had all sprung up on the soybean farms, the corn fields, the uh, apple orchards where I had run around and played as a, as a child. And so looking at that, I, I looked around the history of New Jersey and saw that there had been very little attention to this kind of process in the 20th century, how suburbanization unfolded in the 20th century. Most of the history of New Jersey focused on its larger cities, and particularly only up till about the First World War. So a student in need of a dissertation topic needed to be in the area. I put this together to try and come to this topic. And so in the course of trying to document what happened to these communities, what I came across was a recurring assumption that I want to spend a few minutes with you guys really kind of uprooting. And this is the notion that the black middle class is in somehow similar to the white middle class historically in the United States. And I want to look at some of the ways that we measure that as academics to look at um, and assert that that principle of similarity when in fact the experiences for these people who describe themselves in these ways were quite different. Um, and so to introduce you to the subjects of my study who you'll see in, in some of the slides, I talk a great deal about African American migrants who came to New Jersey from the South and the fact that they were an integral part of the labor force in the first half of the 20th century in these rural areas, but they were arguably even more important as residents of the state because it was their work to expand the promise of democracy to all people. That work expanded the opportunities for later immigrants, um, people from Asia, Latin American countries, and the African continent, to come into New, New Jersey after 1960 and become part of this transformation of a service economy that would emerge after 1960 and continues over the, la the last 40 to 50 years to this day. So the measures of understanding the black middle class and how it has been misunderstood, um, for the most part, um, the people who question the formation of middle class society in the 20th century have emphasized uh, this question about how do families compare to the white middle class by income and net worth. And so these two measures are, are good because the census gives us statistical data that we can compare. We can look at these questions about how much property someone owns, how much debt do they carry. But I think that it's been misleading, that you don't get the sense of actually what it meant to be middle class and African American in the first half of the 20th century by looking at income and net worth. And particularly the dynamics within the African American community, um, how did occupation and social status shape middle class identity? That is, regardless of income, regardless of the property someone owned, how did people then decide who was going to receive kind of um, deference and credit be taken seriously, be considered for leadership positions within community institutions. Um, I did, in the course of the study, look at some of the quantitative data to begin to see how people in this area, and I should say it was a little bit difficult because in looking at farming communities outside of the cities, census data works by looking at large metropolitan areas. And so to go outside of the city and attempt to track small communities, typically this data isn't kept very long if it's kept at all. And so there's a lot of data that had to be kind of reconstructed from multiple sources to begin to infer some of the figures that I came up with. But in uh, 1950, the white median household income in what I call the rural, rural corridor of New Jersey, the counties that did not have large cities in them, um, the median household income for white households was $22,000, a little bit over $22,000, while the black household median income was about $12,000. So you see, you know, nearly 50% disparity there, uh, not terribly surprising given national trends. Um, 
by 2000, so over the 50 years that kind of encompass what we consider the civil rights movement, uh, white household median income rose to 50, nearly $57,000, while black median household income came to nearly $36,000. So substantial gains for each. Um, but again, the numbers don't really tell the story, particularly income. Net worth is a little bit more helpful, but more on the national level. The most striking statistic that I found for looking at middle class in terms of net worth, and uh, when I talk about net worth, it's the property you own minus the debt that you have. Um, I look at a sociologist named Dalton Conley, who has a book called uh, Being Black, Living in the Red. And in this book, he talks about the historical arc since the Civil War of black property ownership and black net worth. And as a percentage of national net worth, that is, how much of all of the net worth in the United States is held by African Americans decade by decade. And he finds that in 1870, after the Civil War, African Americans held about half of 1% of all the net worth in the United States, all right? So 0.5%. In 2000, when he comes back and looks at this number again, he finds that half of 1% of all the net worth in the United States was held by African Americans. So there had been absolutely no change across that 130 years. He actually does point out that this number peaked in the 1920s at about 2% of all net worth in the United States held by African Americans. This is one of these moments that we associate with the nadir of race relations. When lynching and race riots really tore the country apart in many ways. But this was the peak of African American net worth as percentage of the whole. And so that helped me tease out some other questions about the nature of the struggle for civil rights and what actually changed about the material circumstances of these families. But um, what I found as I looked through the oral histories that I did, the newspaper articles I collected, the diaries and letters that people wrote was that the African-American households in the rural corridor became preoccupied with what jobs people worked, so the occupation, the nature of the occupation shaped your social standing, and then your status in terms of who you associated with, um, sometimes by education but not always. Occupation and social status was instead the foundation of the black middle class identity up till 1950. But then after 1950, it increasingly became about luxury consumption. That is, to be able to buy certain status objects and show them became this sign of the kind of home you own, the kind of neighborhood you lived in, the uh, type of car or television. These things became more prominent after 1950. And so from there, once I had a sense of that trend, I would wanted to get a hold of the context that these families occupied. And I will say, I, last time I did this presentation, a lot of people were shocked at the next slide, so uh, hopefully won't, won't upset folks with this. Um, but in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, those of you who've taken you know, the history classes um, know that this is a period of the consolidation of racist ideologies. Schools of thought like craniology, uh, phrenology, eugenics, Egyptology dominated the intellectual debate to justify the ideas of racial superiority, superiority and inferiority. Um, as important as those pseudoscientific debates were, what I found when I looked at the early 20th century in the rural corridor was um, how these ideas trickled down through popular culture, and particularly newspapers and magazines. And so over and over again, every day there were kind of racist depictions of African Americans that were ridiculing and demeaning their ability to participate in American society. And so in one case, this was a cartoon called Poor Robinson Crusoe. And this is just one example. This is not even by any stretch the most severe example. But um, this is a depiction of an African Friday um, sitting on the uh, tree branch with an orangutan. And um, in this photo, Friday is saying, um, it am acting like I was its long lost brother. And the orangutan says, oogle, google, yum, yum. Um, the context is that the orangutan is attempting to seduce Friday and engage in a romantic or sexual relationship. And this was, again, what these people came into contact with as they settled in these communities. This was the kind of uh, saturation of the media.
before we have television, before there were motion pictures. Um, this series was in 1909. Most of the pictures I got of these, these kinds of uh, cartoons came out of the period from 1907 to 1911. And so um, this is the ground within which, um, I guess in the next decade, the second Ku Klux Klan took root and emerged and became a popular force not only in the South, but in the North and Midwest, and particularly in the rural corridor of New Jersey. That this was a particularly hostile terrain to African American families attempting to find a way to make a difference and gain a different foothold in their life. Um, these authorities, the um, academic debates as well as the popular debates on the function of race in the American society, uh, denied the possibility of black achievement and excellence. Um, any appearance of middle class aspiration in southern rural communities invoked the vigilante murders of lynchings and race riots before 1930. So there's a really concrete way of enforcing this kind of expectation. In northern cities, native born whites and immigrant Europeans displayed similar hostility to the visibility of educated and prosperous African Americans. That is, this is not just restricted to native born whites who are considered, you know, the true Americans within these communities. Um, while these feelings were clearly present in rural New Jersey, as well as states like Ohio, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and New York, uh, the violent suppression of African American families and their organizations was much more rare. That is, in the rural corridor, you, don't, you see lynchings. There are periodic lynchings between 1880 and 1920. There are cases where you have people attacked in their homes and their homes destroyed. But on the scale and frequency that occurred in the rest of the country, it wasn't that frequent. Um, as a result, these families, although being migrants and not having much when they arrived, they're still able to gain access to and own their own home, to pursue degrees of education that weren't possible in places like North Carolina and South Carolina. And then they're able to begin civil rights organizations as early as 1917 in, the, in small towns in New Jersey. Um, more importantly, they were able to negotiate the way segregation laws in the North and these pol private policies that maintain segregation um, would be enforced. So in many cases, if you could not get access to a restaurant or a hotel or a beach, your first appeal might not get heard, your second appeal might, might not get heard. But over time, you could develop a personal relationship with the local authorities that would allow you and your family to create spaces that would enable other African Americans to access these public facilities. And so there, isn't, there are lawsuits that happen through the 20s and 30s, but far more frequently in small communities, people gradually negotiate access to new opportunities that had been, had been denied them when they first arrived. And so this spatial and political and economic manifestation of racism was in flux. There were times when it would be stringently enforced. There are other times when it would be not enforced at all. And the personalities of the people involved often dictated the outcomes of the encounter. One of the people that I emphasize in the um, book that I have out now, Path to Freedom, is a man named Walter Hamm. Um, his is the kind of story that I try and deal with, well, I come across a lot. That um, Walter Hamm is a man who was never elected to political office. Uh, he never started a civil rights organization. Um, his most prestigious job that he ever worked in his life was janitor of the local high school. Um, what he's able to discuss, both in the newspaper articles that talk about his family and in the ways that I, the oral histories I did with his children, is essentially that he understood the limits of segregation on his life. And for the most part, he accepted them. He didn't go out of his way to overthrow or confront people to change his condition or opportunity. But what he taught his children was that they were to never accept them. And so he taught them to go on, whereas he only had a fourth grade education, all of his children graduated from high school. Half of his children graduated from college. And so this was in the period from 1935 to 1945, before you see the national efforts to desegregate education. Um, that commitment was what was really reflective of many of the stories that unfolded in, in the rural corridor, is that people said, we're going to take the long view. And over time, new opportunities will come. Just to give you a sense of the types of places uh, these families were moving to, uh, this is a photo taken in 1990 
of the type of migrant labor housing that persisted in these communities. Uh, you can't see the full houses. This is kind of this wide view of the whole camp. But um, I guess I can show you most on this, this, flat, this third house from the front. This would be the kitchen and eating area. This window here would be a small bathroom. And this bed, this would be the bedroom where the whole family would sleep in a single bed. So they're essentially, you know, two and a half room shacks. Um, in many of the communities that I study, places are a half the size of that with a common outhouse for folks to use. And so these communities are the places that people settled in and began to build these lives from um, through the middle, the early in the middle of the 20th century. Um, an historical portrait of rural African Americans in the North has to begin with the recognition that the majority of black residents in these communities were working class or impoverished. Um, they often lived in these kinds of one to three room buildings, often without running water or electricity uh, throughout most of the 20th century. However, this did not preclude the formation of a black rural middle class. On the contrary, the first generation of African American migrants to settle in rural New Jersey did so with the explicit expectation that their children's success in gaining secondary or even post-secondary education would enable them to escape the lives of domestic service and manual labor that this generation of migrants endured. Um, to give you a few of the pictures of the folks, um, the, one of the people who donated a number of pictures to me is uh, Mar Nicey Marion Ham Russell. She was, uh, this is the first child of Walter Ham. Um, she was born in 1914 in New Bern, North Carolina. Her family fled from New Bern when, under mysterious circumstances, the entire black section of town was burned. And so her family barely escaped. Uh, they lived in New Jersey from 1923 to 2004. Uh, she lived in New Jersey from 1923 to 2004. She died in 2004 in Freehold, New Jersey. Um, I love this portrait of her. This was uh, taken in 1946 when she completed um, her nursing training at Harlem Hospital. This became kind of a point of pride for her family that she was actually able to go on and achieve and become a professional in a way that her mother and father could not. Um, a picture of her cousins taken in North Carolina. Um, on the left is um, Inez. In the middle is George. No, excuse me. In the middle is Leroy. And on the right is George. And um, I, I really did a whole set of these photos in the book that show this backdrop of kind of this um, where the people are aspiring to live. Right? You see this tapestry in the back about the path leading to the house, the gated access, the two-floor home, the second um, space, um, the shed or the garage area towards the back, the kind of floral um, arrangement to the top sides of each wall. Um, you see Inez is carrying a purse. Um, you know, this is kind of shaping their dreams of where they belong and what they're trying to pursue. And it's they who, when they become teenagers and in their 20s, that are going to be this migrant generation. Uh, this photo is approximately 1907. Um, there's a question mark on the back of it in Marion's collection, so it's around then. Um, but yeah, these are the groups of folks who then made, took the risk to try and change their circumstance. Um, in another way, um, Marion's husband, uh, Wendell, these are his cousins, the Hill family from Ohio. Um, while they also lived in, in the rural community, um, you can see that there's still this kind of sense of family dignity. It's not a formal family portrait. They're outside of their home. But you see the way they're kind of emphasizing the kind of joy of and access to opportunity that they had. It's going to be different than what we see happen with Wendell when he encounters Marion and uh, when they begin dating and how the family relationships unfold from there. But um, it's not just south to north migration. There's also this migration um, from the Midwest into the east, and not always to these major cities. You have rural people trying to find rural communities where they're going to have better access and more freedom. Uh, the last one is uh, William Ham. This is Marion's uncle. Um, the smallest child in the previous photo was Leroy. This is Leroy's older brother. And it's the two of them who encouraged their third brother, Walter, Marion's father, for all of them to move north. All right, and so again, you see, this is his only suit. You know, this is his late teenage years. Um, 
the kind of ways that, you know, this, this was in a period when he was working as a ditch digger. This was, you know, something where he felt like he had gotten away from working on a farm and had a better job. But this is him in his Sunday clothes, and I thought it kind of, again, conveyed the sense of the aspiration of how the dignity and self-image was very different than a lot of the images that they were portrayed as at the time. So um, even prior to the, what we do in the traditional historical narrative about the Great Migrations uh, to the urban north between 1910 and 1970, um, some black southern migrants traveled to the rural north as part of a seasonal labor, labor cycle. It's how they learned about these farming communities to begin to seek them out to settle in them. As more migrants settled in the region, the rural communities became attractive des destinations. That is, more people would settle with them as people became aware of them and would travel along these paths. Um, although not successful in every case, the growth of rural African American communities in New Jersey presents a substantial contrast with the urban experiences of the African American movement to the north, um, particularly with the swiftness of home ownership. One of the common stories I teach when I talk about segregation in American history is the way that banks and real estate, um, individual realtors and real estate agencies discriminate by steering folks to certain kinds of housing or prevent um, loans from people financing the acquisition of their first home. Um, in the rural north, the negotiations that um, took place often relied on black domestic servants who worked for prosperous white families who would vouch for their credibility and enable them to purchase their first home 20 and 30 years before we see in northern cities. And so um, I have a couple of photos in the book that show when um, Marion and Wendell Russell purchased their first home is on um, an entirely segregated block in Freehold. Uh, they were the first African American families to move in there. Uh, the fact that they were an older couple, they married in their late 30s, uh, they had no children, these things were certainly kind of part of the negotiation. But as Marion described it, it was really the reliance on the people she worked for as a child, as a babysitter, um, as a domestic and a nanny and a cook, the Earhart family, that recommended her to the bank that enabled she and Wendell to purchase this home. Um, and that was in 1952. So again, we're dealing with the period before national civil rights reform. Um, as, this, as this generation unfolds, you see a number of people kind of, these kinds of photos become much more frequent as people dress in their Sunday best and their celebrations out. Access to camera technology plays in here. But these kinds of images in the 50, uh, late 40s through the early 60s, became the kind of um, assertion of the dream that people had pursued. They're able to accomplish what their parents had set out for them. And so um, this also goes in the context of military desegregation after 1948. Um, Fort Monmouth uh, military base was the core of Atlantic communications um, dating back to the First World War. And they had had a uh, segregated police force on the base up until 1951, and um, there's a picture of the integration, the integration of the military police. This is um, Wendell, Marion's husband, standing in the back middle. Uh, they also had um, the first Asian member. I haven't been able to track down his name, but uh, this gentleman here shows that this wasn't just a black-white issue. This is a kind of shift in the paradigm of who belongs in the roles of authority and management at the military base that begin to have profound social consequences beyond the formal institution. Um, this is uh, John Hamm, Marion Jungus brother, who had served in Germany in uh, 1954 to 58. And over there, he met his wife, Johanna. Um, they had their first child is Jean on the left. And their second child is um, John. And uh, it's born in 1960. This picture is from 1960. Um, this is again prior to the Loving versus Virginia case, when it would have been extremely dangerous for an integrated couple to travel in many parts of the United States. But again, this is part of the way that the military facilitated the transformation of social relationships. And there are dozens of photographs that Marion took between 1955 and 1975 of she and her family going into integrated settings, recreational settings, parks, hotels, restaurants, and mostly cruises. And you kind of see these gradual decline of the shocked look on white families' faces in the photos as these black families are taking their pictures. 
And so it was just a striking contrast to look at that over time and see how the social relations were changing little by little just by opening the doors. Um, and so this is a slide about Fort Monmouth and the importance of how the military installation changed the dynamics in these small towns. This was a manifestation in New Jersey of the way African Americans could publicly assert their pride after 1945. Um, legislative responses like the New Jersey's, uh, New Jersey's Fair Employment Practice Law, the Civil Rights Act of 1949, and the creation of the Division Against Discrimination in the Department of Education. This, these things opened the door for aggressive African American leadership within state government. People no longer had to defer their sense of belonging for a full generation. They could actually take advantage and pursue legal recourse in ways that their parents couldn't. Over the next day, decade, from 1955 to 1965, a surge of black political involvement transformed urban areas like Newark, Trenton, Camden, and Atlantic City. However, small towns, all these little places in the rural corridor, remained resistant to the changes that were coming through the state legislature. That is, they found ways to subvert the law and maintain the kind of um, negotiated race relations. So the way that negotiation had brought down barriers 20 and 30 years earlier, negotiation was maintaining barriers as civil rights reform swept through New Jersey. And so the fight over the remainder of the 20th century that has been fairly well documented about the South, how southern communities and states resisted desegregation orders, efforts to integrate public spaces. These things were also happening in the rural north, in the small communities that eventually transform and become suburbs after 1960. However, in 1965, uh, Walter Hamm, with the help of three of his daughters, was able to purchase his and his wife's dream house. Um, this uh, photo was taken from the corner of Marion's yard that she had purchased with Wendell 13 years earlier. And so their success is then given back to their father and mother, that they have a place that they can enjoy. There's another really great photograph that I have that shows Walter with his two youngest daughters after they installed a, a red doorway on this home. And so it was this occasion to kind of celebrate that this red door meant that they had become middle class, that they now belonged in a way that he could have never imagined or that he could only dream of when he first arrived in the area. Um, inside the home, this is a portrait of Walter in the middle. And in the photo, the boy on the left with the three little kids. Uh, this is George, now an old man. <laughs> and so uh, this is a picture of Walter with his grandson and his great-grandchildren. And um, I, I really enjoy this picture because of the little wry smile on his face. Like I always try and put myself in his mind and see kind of what is that moment to be there with those people in that place after all he had seen and kind of risked to get there. And so um, it was crucial that there were these negotiations to try and integrate these communities. Um, but the failure to turn those negotiations into more substantive transformation and real integration more widely for people in the suburbs after 1970 was, was a real failure and something that we still live with today. Uh, the transformation of small towns like these throughout New Jersey and, and all the states um, really contributed to the way the, so, the society became a global society um, over the last generation. Um, African Americans simultaneously experienced access to homes, cars, televisions, all kinds of new technology that they could barely afford a generation earlier. While at the same time, they increasingly abandoned the habits of thrift, careful planning that their parents and grandparents had used in order to get them to the place where they could have access to all of that. Um, Bill, George, and Walter Hamm, the main figures in the book, um, used every resource at their disposal to pursue a better future where their children could overcome racism and white supremacy. Without the same commitment to community investment at the end of the 20th century, uh, black Americans in this region increasingly became part of a consumer middle class. Um, one of the effects of this, and um, this leaves these up here as a kind of general notes, is that 
in uh, the town where they live, this uh, freehold, the first African American elected to municipal council uh, won his race in 2007. And he, <laughs> don't look at me shocked. <laughs> Uh, he is currently up for re-election, and it's, it's not looking good. When we come up in November, it's, it's quite probable he won't win. But um, the developments legislatively have not turned into the ways that these places have adopted um, a way to inclusively represent the people who live there. And so in those ways, the middle class was formed but became less influential politically in the places that they lived. note on the sources, you know, where I got all the pictures from. Uh, that was my talk. If you have any questions, you know. Go for it. Have you come across any, I can't say comparable, but any studies of the American rural South, African American? The closest thing that I've seen is Andrew Weiss's book, Places of Their Own, and how he begins to look at the process of African American migration out from farms, but not into southern cities, so that they can find similar opportunities for better home ownership, and particularly local control of schools is really crucial to those places. And so with larger numbers of people, um, I'm trying to think types of places I'm looking at in New Jersey from 1900 to 1950 vary between about 250 people and about 5,000 people. So they're really small. Um, in the south they tend to be a little bit larger. They're still smaller than cities, but they might be you know, 10,000, 12,000, 15,000 people. And so they do have the ability to kind of organize. And where you see that growth is in that Dalton Connolly figure about the 2% of net worth. That's almost entirely southern in the 1920s very little net worth growth in the north of the Midwest in the same way. Just a quick follow-up. Uh, I, I, I commend to, first of all, you and congratulate your research because it gives me, and I think many of the rest of us, a perspective that is comparable, comparable to the lives that each of us had in our, and I'm assuming we're all from the rural north or the rural south, but our own rural existence and the realities that were quite, quite different from the urban metropolitan areas. And Greensboro is actually a good place to begin making a comparative study yeah, that's been the real gift of you know a really terrible situation with my family that kind of brought me to it was it gave me a, an intellectual framework for appreciating yeah. studying where I come from right. and understanding it in a different way than just being a part of it yeah. kind of stepping back from it and taking a fresh looking at it with fresh eyes and looking at the documents that represent it and that's what I try to teach the students in my classes especially in senior seminar is to look very carefully at where they come from and separate themselves, step back from it, and then try to assess it historically. And it leads to all kinds of good fruits. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry, you would put your hand up. I just wanted to see the last slide where there was a, uh, I was looking for a note about a relationship between uh, declining influence of social institutions and, uh, and the rise of consumer, the consumer middle class that you were talking about. Yeah. Um, with the consolidation of this kind of consumerist middle class, the places that were the foundations of the attempt to integrate, negotiate where people went to negotiate the end of public segregation, uh, the African American churches that were founded throughout the 19th century, the uh, segregated schools that were formed in defiance of New Jersey constitutional law between 1880 and 1920, um, these places where, where people went to gather and begin to try and pursue these dreams of finding a, a better life. And, well, again, the best example I can give you is of nearly 100 
segregated elementary schools that existed, probably 1940 in New Jersey. There are two buildings left. One is entirely empty and just to do a lot of fundraising work just to maintain the building. And the other is uh, now used as a community center, but there, you know, otherwise this entire story would have been erased, like no one values it. And you see the people who move out from the cities, African Americans who move out from the cities after 1970, and this has been a trend about sociological understanding, the new black middle class that emerges in these communities at the end of the 20th century, they don't invest in those older institutions. They, they conscientiously find ways to either start new organizations or to not identify racially. And so there's a, there's a wedge between the folks who have lived there two and three generations before and the folks who have arrived in the last generation. Would you say the Ruben Carter murder trial in the middle of the 1960s influenced the African American uh, rural and suburban communities? I don't think the trial in particular did that. Like I, I'm trying to show that those things go back a little bit further. Things like the controversy around Reuben Carter. What I found when I looked at these rural communities was a really kind of horrifying thing that happened after that kind of incident. Is that instead of, and it was bad before, when you had folks like Reuben Carter kind of routinely harassed and policed and, and shepherded through jail and the penal system um, 40 and 50 years before that. What surprised me was, and I deal with this in, in my next book, when I deal with the kind of um, transformation of civil rights organizations, is I looked at, at the heart of civil rights organizing in these communities were always the people between the ages of 15 and 35. And that was the core, core core group that transformed and demanded new things um, over time. That group, after 1965, is aggressively incarcerated in these rural communities. So much so that the two largest penal institutions for young men, it's almost 75% of the people coming into them, between 65 and 85, are no longer coming from Newark or Trenton or Atlantic City. They're coming from New Brunswick. They're coming from Cherry Hill. And so the shift towards these suburban settlement patterns, these young people who grew up in these areas are going into prison and are being incarcerated longer on average. And so there's this whole generation of folks who would have been the backbone of civil, continuing civil rights work at the end of the 20th century that are effectively taken out and marginalized from being able to have a job, pursue education, and be able to develop a solid family foundation the way that their parents and grandparents had. And so that was very surprising to me. I didn't realize, I had a stereotype in my mind going into it, that most of the growth of the prison industrial complex in New Jersey would have come from the urban centers. I was astonished to see that instead it came from these rural and suburban areas. Um, my question, it, is I think uh, sort of thinking about what you said earlier about up until 1950, the kind of mark of the middle class is this um, occupation and social status. Yeah. And a couple of times you said, you, it, it, talking about um, uh, marking the clothing of people, their, their Sunday best, their Sunday best. Yeah. And I'm wondering about the role of the church. Now this, actually the period I'm thinking of is probably kind of at the tail end of the period you're studying here and kind of more moving towards your next book. But I'm wondering if the church served as any kind of formal site for civil rights work like it did in the South. So I'm thinking like Montgomery, Alabama and the you know, weekly meetings um, uh, during the bus boycott. Let's say that it's all centered around the church. Did it work like that in the rural in North? Freehold? No. Okay. In that particular place, no. In other larger, where you had larger African American rural communities, yes. Okay. So Creole, where you're dealing with about 700 people in 1930, the church was the place where people went for inspiration and they got the ideas about how not to internalize the messages that they were communicated as they worked as domestic servants, as they worked as manual laborers. But it was the school on the day to day basis. That was the organizing center for groups like the NAACP, uh, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. They met in the segregated schoolhouses. Um, 
in larger communities, um, Gould Town or an all-black town like Whitesboro, those places, yeah, you had a more aggressive church that the minister was the one who went with either the principal or maybe sometimes even just the deaconess would go and confront the local mayor or the constable about issues of access and segregation. So that's my sense of it, is that the larger the community, the more the church did civil rights work. But he, even earlier, even in bigger places, the church was a kind of separate space. It didn't move into activism until late 20s, early 30s, in the bigger centers, in the bigger towns. So in some, in some ways, though, it sounds like that the church serves as this purpose, as you, say, as you said, about sort of empowering the people mentally yeah. and psychologically, but Absolutely. that it's not necessarily this Didn't turn into organizing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not, not in smaller black, not the smallest of the community. Like that. When, when you had said, uh, and I apologize for me, you said so that they, um, so the, the first generation sort of gradually negotiated access to things like homes and, 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 and it, it sounded like they were able to secure mortgages because they had white patronage to do yes. you know, to sort of vouch for them. Um, and, and then your, your, what you were talking about earlier, this sort of astonishing fact that you know, about, about who ends up incarcerated in the next generation. So, so I, I just kind of want to like, how, how did you see those, what explains the success of those negotiations, say, prior to 1920-ish? Yeah. And then, and then how it changes? Because most of the folks I interviewed were born between 1910 and 1930, the earliest reaches, you know, it's where the memory gets right. fuzziest right. about that. In those transcripts, they tend to attribute that to personality. You know, like, oh, there's this relationship, we like this, this very individual, very particular. Um, someone at a different session like this raised, raised the troubling question that, you know, I realized in a larger context, but hadn't thought to apply when I'm dealing with domestic servants that I've interviewed, is, and I, I was aware of their silence on this question that was troubling, but I, I never pushed into it to kind of reach at the core of it. Um, there's this issue about the role of domestic sexually within a white household, and kind of harassment and access issues that might have triggered a sense of guilt from a patron to say I give back. And when they asked me the question in this other setting, it immediately made me think of reunions where white families that employed black, black domestics, there are a couple of awkward shots of older men in the white family being kind of overly physically friendly in ways that looked awkward in the photo. And it made me reflect like I don't have someone speaking to it and saying this happened to me on this date and occasion and it was repeated, but there was enough absence and silence and awkwardness visual in the visual evidence for me to say, you know, there's something that's not right there that might play into another motivation that's not just, oh, we, we, were, like, we were nice people, we got along and everything worked out. Do you think, uh, would it have anything to do with, because uh, you also said, so the first generation um, they 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 didn't they didn't they had sort of more limited expectations, whereas the next generation really wanted to claim some of this American dream. Well, that, well, that Ham family to flee from North Carolina, like there's a story that um, I believe it was Marion. It's either Marion or her sister Kate. One of the two of them tells a story about remembering their mother kind of carrying them across a stream as, the, as their home in town was burning behind them. You know, and you know, these, these little kids, it, it must have been Marion, because she was about six or seven, maybe she would have remembered some sense of that and that trauma. But for, for her husband, Walter, to kind of come out of that, you know, I, the sense of utter loss and the fact that whatever you get can be taken away at a moment, you know, that, that I, I can't argue with any sense of, you know, well, I can only do so much. You know, I can't expect them to come necessarily out of that. I mean, Malcolm X in his autobiography talks about his father being a Garvey who was quite defiant. And, and more defiant, the greater he was confronted. Um, not everybody's like that. 
I would wager and say most people aren't like that. And so that's one thing when I talk about these guys. I like getting the sense of the stories of the people who aren't the exceptional one who rise up and inspire people to organize and then challenge authorities. A lot of folks just kind of say, what can I do that's safe? What can I do that, that will make progress but not risk everything? Her question also makes me think about, I was actually thinking about this when you were talking about, um, although this is not a rural area, but I was thinking about like black pockets of Bryn Mawr, Ardmore, yeah. and I don't know enough about um, research that's been done, but these homeowners mm -hmm. that who were um, domestic those servants those and then eventually larger. bought yeah. houses out here, and it's making me think like what were the circumstances around yeah, the purchasing of these houses. That's why I, I, love being in I love being in Pennsylvania for that story. We can begin to kind of tease that out. And the records are here. You know, yeah. the records when we can trace back yeah, and see these relationships. A lot of people are still alive and we have access to do the stories. But we haven't. You know, there has been this emphasis on saying, you know, we look to where we can find the most evidence. And that's that's tempting. That's you know make good stories that people are familiar with. It. But I do think it's important now we've entered a phase where it's the region has an identity, where Philadelphia is no longer just the city of Philadelphia, it's the four surrounding counties and the counties of New Jersey. And then we need to deal with why things have happened the way they did and what happened as those processes unfolded. That looked like a hand. I was just thinking about Chris's question about um, the communities, the black communities on the main line. They have a, have a different but as interesting history. They date back to to pre-revolutionary times. And so um, it makes you wonder about the evolution of rural, then suburban black communities as a U.S. demographic phenomenon. Because it, most people don't, don't consider, they, the only time that they consider a, a, rural, a rural black community is Southern, all right? Yes. And the only time they consider a rural, a suburban black community is what post 1980, 1990 yeah, America. So it's a it becomes an interesting phenomenon in terms of studying that. But it's a different set of circumstances to some degree. Yeah, you can get some regional particularities that I think are to try and document. Big wind out there. Oh. <laughs> but um, no, one of the biggest debates I have with Andrew Weiss and um, Myra Armstead are kind of the folks I talk most about this subject with. And we, we can't settle on how is rural distinct from suburban. Or I've settled on a preliminary answer. My colleagues are still testing me on how, how convinced they are by my argument. But my argument is the notion of time. And it comes out of the, the oral histories that these people um, shared with me. That industrial time is re relatively regimented. You can talk about uh, the emergence of the town clock with early mills, and then the sense of uh, setting train schedules, and how we organize manufacturing time by the minute through the industrial era. Um, and then suburban time is more governed by kind of how quickly we can cover distance, like automobiles shape our sense of time. Like a lot of people no longer say, oh, it's um, 10 miles from here to West Philly. They'll say, I can get there in 20, 25 minutes. Like time becomes a measure of distance instead in that way. What I talk about with rural time, is that it's much more seasonal, so that it's it's structured by you know um, how warm or cold it is, when the sun rises or sets. Like there's a different pace to that that people feel differently identified. So uh, for Weiss, when he talks about black suburbs, I kind of ask him about you know is there a clock in that town? How did the people move from place to place? You know is there like suburban time? isn't always as fast as urban time, but typically they're both faster than rural time, in my view. And then people go beyond that and start to ask about resorts, because a lot of these other small communities are like beach towns. And so and when you go to the beach, what is the experience there? Like, yeah, when you go in, when you go to get to your hotel, yeah, that's going to be structured by a schedule. When you're going to leave, it's structured by the schedule. But part of the experience of being there is you don't want to be time. You want to lose track of time as much as you can. Don't forget what day it was. And so the other places, urban, rural, suburban, those are all productive in some way. 
you have to kind of have a way of organizing your activity. For recreational time, you want to do the opposite. You don't want it to be a burden on where you have to be when necessarily. And so that's that's my initial kind of suggestion, but you know, like I said, we're still kind of debating it. Oh, please feel free to come check me out at the table, pick up a copy of the book. I thank you all so much. Last time I was here, I lived up on like the second floor of all. <laughs> so it's a very different perspective to come on in, but thank you so much for coming out. This is available for